So today we're going to be looking at James chapter 4. So we've been traveling through the book of James, if you did not know, went through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. And um, I'll be focusing on the last four or five verses of James. Uh, unfortunately, the, the front half there isn't a sermon for because uh, we ended up scrapping that to do the workshop uh, at camp last week. So there's no James 4 part 1. But the truth is that the Word of God is free and you can read it at any time. So I highly recommend checking that out after this. But for today, we'll be focusing on the last five verses. And I just might read some of them and then we'll get stuck into it. So it says in verse 13, it says, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. We'll spend a year there, carry on business and make some money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. I'm not sure if you've read this before, but it's a really, really great chunk. It's one that uh, has played a powerful role in my own life. And I'm not going to beat around the bush. It's pretty straightforward. There's not really, I don't know if you've picked up on this yet, but in the book of James, there's not a lot of hidden meaning. He actually just kind of just goes for the point. He doesn't really beat around the bush. He just goes for it. And this is simply saying, are you seeking other things over God's will? And he uses the example of money and business making a profit. And he's saying, you guys are seeking those things and you haven't invited God into the equation. And he doesn't beat around the bush. He only takes three verses to say that. And what I find really interesting, I don't know if you knew this, but the audience that James writes to is a completely Christian group. In fact, it's not just any Christians, they're a mature Christian group. And the unspoken assumption in this letter is there's actually no new content for them. I don't know if you knew that. There's actually nothing that he was writing to that they wouldn't have known. And he's drawing and relying on the fact that they're going to know he's making heavy ties to the Sermon on the Mount. If you don't know what that is, you can find it in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's a sermon that is recorded uh, in, I guess, in its fullness in Matthew, but it's believed that Jesus would have preached that to every town that he went. Because it would be pretty boring if you're reading the gospel and every time he changes town, you have to read the same three chapters again. So it just says it once, but to assume that he would have done it hundreds of times. And that would have been the Sermon on the Mount. So James is relying on the fact that we know that. And he's also relying on the fact that his audience would have been very, very aware of the Proverbs, which is really just wisdom literature or wisdom statements. And so that's what James's letter is. It's a blend of those two things. It's a blend of the kingdom. And it's a blend of wisdom. And really, how can you have wisdom in the kingdom? How can you have a wisdom mindset whilst pursuing the kingdom of God? And while he's writing this and while people are reading it, he's relying on them knowing verses like, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your kingdom come, not mine. Or in other parts, of, this isn't in the Sermon on the Mount, but he's relying on the fact that they would know things like Jesus in the garden, where he says, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. But the main one that he's relying on people knowing, and it should be a slide behind me, is in Matthew 6.33 where it says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And he knows that they know this. In fact, I'm not sure if you knew this, but most theologians, and I would definitely agree with this, believe that this entire book of James can be summed up in one verse. And it's a sermon that Anne did a few weeks ago in James 1. There's another slide for it. And it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And that's the filter to read this entire book through. But I particularly want us to focus on that today. Why is James writing this? He knows that they know it. But he also knows that they don't live what they know. This, I, I'm assuming isn't a new concept. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, I'm assuming that the concept of discovering and following God's will for your life is not new. But what James is writing to, he's saying, I know that you know that, but I'm trying to give you an example to show you that you don't live it. 
And so he uses this one where he says, I might read a little bit of it again. He says, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. He's like, you're so career focused. You're so money focused. You're so profit focused. You're so stuff focused. He's like, did you even ask God about that? Did you even ask God about that? And I thought the unspoken question of this, he's saying to them, when was the last time you invited God into that process? When was the last time you asked Him to give direction in areas like career and money and finances? And I'm going to be real with you. I think this is more true of our context than His. And statistically, that would back up that belief. I don't know if you've ever heard of a group they're called the Barna Group. They're an amazing group, very helpful for assignments for me, very helpful for sounding smart. And they're a group in America. Their ministry, their entire thing that they do is they're a Christian survey and statistics company. So they go and interview thousands and thousands and thousands of people in America. And let's be honest, the American church, like the Western church, is all quite similar. So there's probably 80% overlap for us. And they're interviewing these people on lots of different stats. And this one survey, I've never forgotten since I've read it. They did this survey. They interviewed close to 10,000 parents. Half of them, Christian parents. Half of them, non-Christian parents. And they could have been from any backdrop. They could have been agnostic, atheist, Hindu, Muslim, whatever. It was just comparing Christian parents and non-Christian parents, but particularly they were asking them on the topic of, of all these 30 plus topics, what kind of advice would you give to your kids? And then by the end of the survey, they were trying to see how different the advice was. And the idea being that if the advice is similar, that's not good. You want the advice to be different because we're influenced by different things. And so the idea being if the advice was really different, it's because they'll be influenced by the word. But if the advice was really similar, it was because it was being influenced by the world. And so they did this. And after their research, there was one category in particular. And I'll be honest, this does not surprise me at all. There was one category in particular where you basically couldn't tell the difference. When you read what the Christian parents' advice was versus the non-Christian parents' advice, the topic where it sounded basically identical was on the era, so on the area of calling slash career, that their advice was almost exactly the same. You couldn't tell the difference. And that is what James is writing to here. So I'll give you an example. Like I'm someone that is a discipleship junkie. I love floating around. I've got been involved in lots of different places at a year at Hillsong did a year at a place in Melbourne. I spent some time at Bethel with their BSSM there. I've done an internship. I've got good connections with some people in YWAM in Canberra. And now my beautiful wife is literally a YDT trainer at the Year of Discipleship and Training at LL. And I float around this stuff all the time. I love this space. And I can tell you based on my own experience and based on statistics like this one, the thing that gets most in the way of a young person wanting to take a gap year for God is their parents. The biggest thing that gets in the way of parents taking a gap year for God is the church. I just want you to sit in that. I know it's our 10.30 service and it's supposed to be bright and exciting and new era, but this is what God's put on my heart that actually the research points to that we give terrible advice in this area. And actually, I've got a friend of mine, he's moved back to America now, but his job when he was at Hillsong was at certain points of the year, right before the new intake, they would have people that would be up at like awful times of the night. It'd be like midnight to 8 a.m. where they would be on standby for anyone around the world to call in and ask any question they wanted from any like current student. And he did that for years. And he told me dozens of stories where he'd be chatting to someone on the phone asking like, can I get a job? Like, how does like, like does Australia have like a green card equivalent or how I get a bank statement or all these different things. And he'd be talking to them and all of a sudden they'd go very, very quiet. They go very quiet on the phone because mum and dad have just walked past and they don't know that they're applying. 
and they can't tell them that yet because they know they'll talk them out of it. The advice would be something like this. It's like, do you want to be a pastor? Is there any good money in that? Is that something of value to you? Like actually, like, have you thought about the interest rates and mortgage? Have you seen how hard it is to buy a house? Like actually, you should finish your teaching degree. Finish your teaching degree and do that. That would be good. That would be good. And actually, like, if you, if you just set yourself up that you can be safe and self-sustaining, that would be good. You know what? You go to church once a month. That's okay. You don't need to go do that. Why do you need to go do that? And I cannot tell you how many people I know that want to pursue God. They want to pursue God more. And the biggest talking out factor is, have you thought about money? Have you thought about a career? But that is not what Jesus says. He says, seek first the kingdom. Like it's not up for debate. Seek first the kingdom and all these things like money, like career, like a safe house, like all that stuff, God will look after it. It's really coming down to, do you trust God? Do you trust that God who is infinitely outside of all of time, that he would know what's best for you? It literally talks about it. It says, your life is but a mist. Your life is so short. He's the alpha and the omega. He knows the beginning from the end and he knows definitely what's best. And the best thing that we could possibly do is to seek his will for our life. But for a lot of us, that's actually not a priority. And the research confirms that. And I don't know where you are in this room. And I'm not judging anyone. Can I just clarify? I'm not picking on parents. This study was just on parents. But the truth is that if you look at senior ministry and um, board and eldership in churches, they're all made up of parents. Like actually, that's the prime age group making decisions in churches. And that's the prime age group that hasn't learnt this. And that is what James is writing to. He's basically asking one key question. He's saying, what are you prepared to sacrifice to follow God's will? Because it will cost you. Like, I don't want to beat around the bush. Like, it will cost you. And it's something that has cost me on many, many times. But actually, it's always, always, always worth it. Like, I don't know if you knew this. Bree and I didn't want to come here. We didn't want to move back to Sea town <laughs> Like, I grew up here and I had a lot of painful memories here. And God used that and got me on, like, a discipleship pathway. I don't want to come back here. Heck No. I was really happy in Canberra. It's two and a half hours away from the snow. I had a season pass and I could go on any Saturday I wanted. Not to mention, I'm a bit of a coffee enthusiast, not snob. Coffee enthusiast. And the culture's so much better there. So much good coffee. But like lots of things, like the nature reserves, like life was good. Life was really good. It makes it sound like I'm really unhappy. I do like it here. I'll get to that. But life was really, really good. And it was the start of 2021. Bree and I are about to get married and we're just getting really excited about what our life's going to look like. We're talking about like, should we do this and should we do that? And like the internship's done. So it's like, oh, am I going to get a job with the church that we're at? Like that could be cool. Like I've never been a paid pastor before. That'd be all right. And we're discussing these things and someone who had no idea of our situation gave us a prophetic word. They were like, excuse me. They were like, I don't know if this means anything to you, but I've got a scripture for you. And the scripture they gave us is the one I just read out from James. The one was like, you can say you're going to go here, do this, do that, but you don't know what your life will look like. And we took that and I was really convicted by that. I was like, yeah, you're right. I haven't actually asked God about any of these decisions. And we thought and we prayed and we tried our best to discern. And we felt that by the end of 2021, God would do something dramatic in our life. Now, at the time, the dramatic thing in my life, I was convinced was that I would get a job with the church that we were at. For a lot of reasons. I had another word from someone at a, uh, a big conference a few years earlier. They said, Matt, you've got two years before your ministry will take off. And I was really impacted by that. And I took that, not literally, like to the, to the very second he said it, but roughly in a two-year window, God's going to do something big. And that two-year window was rolling around in September of last year. 
and it's rolling around getting closer and closer and um, the, the senior pastor at the old church was coming to retirement and a new pastor was coming in and some big changes were happening and we started to talk about endorsement for me and getting involved in the, I was with the Crosslink Network and getting, I guess, more on a, on a, a, a trajectory or a pathway towards that. And then it got to August and we had a meeting as a church and it was decided, they were like, Matt, as you know, we're striving more and more towards the house church model, towards the discipleship multiplication model. And so we're moving away from paying pastors. And we actually feel that if we do that for you, it's sending the wrong message that anyone can do it. And I was like, that's great. That really stuffs up my plans. And that was in August. That's right before, Matt, your ministry is about to take off. And I've just been told, Matt, you'll probably never get paid here. Maybe like one day a week, but really we can't afford it. And we felt so strongly from God to take this seriously of what's the big change. And so we prayed and we really felt God was bugging me for months. And I kept like pushing in the side. I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But we felt that we had to do a Daniel fast. I don't know if you know what that is. There's many interpretations of it, but the one that we do is 21 days of fasting from pleasurable food. So pleasurable food being things like no meat, no dairy, God help us, no coffee, no artificial sugar, all these things. I went through withdrawals, a whole bunch of stuff, but it wasn't even enough. And there were many days where we went without food like altogether. And I remember on so many occasions, like this is during lockdown, so like I wasn't working a whole lot and stuff. And I remember saying, God, like I want you and I want your will more than I want food. I want you more than I want this comfortable life that I've currently got. And I literally like was brought to my knees on so many occasions. I'm like, God, I want you. I want you. I just want you. And you get in this space where you're like, God, I'd do anything. It's like, if you want me to go to India, I'll do it. I'll sell everything and move to the middle of nowhere and just preach the gospel in a language I can't preach. And let's just send it. And you get in that space and then God does reveal the thing. You're like, well, that plan sucks. (laughs) Like, I don't want to do that. (laughs) I don't want to do that at all. And I was about day, like this whole time I have a prospect has come up. Like, I can't believe how many things from the enemy were coming up as like distractions in this time of like, or oh, maybe that's what we're going to do. Maybe that's what we're going to do. And I was offered to take over the ACT position for uh, um, an organization called Young Life. Not sure if you know who they are or not, but basically they run youth group type programs in schools. And so I was offered to take over the branch for the entire ACT, and that was full time. So I'm going from zero dollars to full time. I'm like, this is it. This is word of the Lord. But nothing sat right with me. I'm like, I really want this to be it. I can keep my coffee and my snowboarding. This will be fantastic. And it got to day 19 of 21 in this Daniel fast. And I get a call from dad. And I'm like, oh, maybe something to do with this. And it was, and it was news I did not want to hear. And he was like, hey, mate, um... I'm just calling to give you a heads up. Um, We're actually about to offer your wife a job for next year. But I just wanted to tell you that because I didn't want you to think I was going behind your back. I was like, thanks, Dad. Appreciate it. Hang up the phone. (coughs) Very upset. I just knew like the Holy Spirit was so over that. I was like, Campbelltown? It's like, I want to go back to Campbelltown. But on top of that, I was like, God, didn't you hear what we were praying? Someone said that my ministry was going to take off in two years. I know we're one flesh, but this deal sucks. I was like, my ministry, God, and all the entitlement, all the selfishness, all this is coming up. And they needed an answer pronto. They needed to know if we would take it quickly because otherwise I had to start interviewing people in time for the new 2022 year. And we felt from God to take it. And I was really upset. Like I, I was quite, quite angry at that. But we felt from God that was the right thing to do and we took it and there were no prospects. Like, sorry, for me. Just thinking all about me. No prospects for me. And I was like, like, this whole whole fast is for me, God. And like, all this is coming up and I laugh about it now. But that's what was going on. And we felt to take it. And while this is all happening, there was a job opportunity that came up potentially with Young Life in the MacArthur region because I knew I was moving back. And like uh, the, the head of Young Life is giving me a call and he's like, I might be able to do something for you and start something in the MacArthur region. We're going to try and start raising some money. 
And I was like, yes. And it's funny how like, depending on how well the plan changes for you, is how happy you are to go with God's will. I was getting really convicted. I'm like, I'm so boycotting this when I don't like it. and I love it when it seems to suit me. I was just so convicted by that. And it's going on. But eventually that fell through. There was no Young Life job. They couldn't raise the, uh, the funds in this area. But he gives me a call, this director guy. He's a good friend of ours. And he says, Matt, as the, uh, as the head of Young Life, my strong advice is that you take the Campbell role. He didn't know that we'd already taken the Sydney one at this point. He was like, to take the Campbell role, you'll do me a lot of favours and send me a lot of headaches from an advertising process. He's like, but as your friend and as someone who loves God, you should give this guy a call. This guy being Ryan Graham. He was like, they've been looking for a youth pastor for six months and you'd be perfect for that spot. Here's his number. And the rest is history. We met on Zoom, still lockdown time, so we met on Zoom. And as soon as I saw him on Zoom, I'm like, he will be my boss. I just knew it. And I had to play, play it down like I didn't know because it's going to be weird in the interviewing process if I'm like, can't wait to work for you kind of thing. <laughs> had to pretend I didn't know like I was still discerning, but I knew. I wasn't stupid. <laughs> I knew. And so we played that through. But like, but like actually on a serious note, like that move cost us a lot. That move cost us a lot. And it was really, really, really hard on lots of levels. As in it was really hard because on one level, it was people getting really upset that we were going. Like, how could you do this to us? How could you leave? The groups just start. It's going to disintegrate when you go. It was on that level. But on the other level, to be honest, I don't think anyone knew how much of a sacrifice it was for us to come back. Like we were probably more sad from people being like, it's so good, you must be so happy, right? And we're like, no, like actually we're not. We actually felt so alone in that time. You might be like, Matt, you are not selling following God's will at all. Like why are you saying it's so depressing? But the truth is, like as in genuinely, you couldn't pay me anything to leave here now. Seriously, like as in, like you don't know what God will do in your heart if you're obedient to him. Like, I love it here. Like, I'm not just saying that because I'm paid to say that or something. Like, I love this church and I love this people and I wouldn't change it for anything. I love you too, Rosemary and everybody else. <laughs> but seriously though, like, I love it here, but you have to take a leap of faith and you have to make tough sacrifices. Like, I know I was joking about it, but like, that was really, really hard to give up like my favorite thing, like snowboarding and stuff. Like, that was really tough. But I would love to see us be a church of people making tough decisions of, of like, actually like, no, I'm not gonna play soccer or train for soccer four or five nights a week. Like, I'm going to give up two of those nights so I can be a part of a life group. Heck, I'm going to start a life group. That'd be awesome. Or like, actually, no, like, God, like, I'm going to choose, maybe it's to give up an entire year and go train somewhere. Like, I will never talk someone out if they think they want to go get discipled somewhere, even if they never come back. I will never talk someone out of that. And I want us to be a people that would do the same. Like if someone's like, I'm going to quit my engineering degree one year from the finish to pursue God, that we would go, yes, I believe that. That's countercultural. That's very, very not this world. And it's very offensive, to be completely honest. I talked about in 1 Peter, he says, Jesus is the rock of offense. Like actually to really go hard for this, it's going to offend this world. It's going to offend people around. But that's what we're to go after. And actually God is good. God is good. There is no way that he would go through everything he went on the cross, that horrific death to reunite us to him, if he was going to give you bad plans. And we can say, yes, I know that he died for my sins, but your belief in that gets really tested in situations like this. Like I could say, God, I trust you. I'll follow you anywhere. And he's like, good, go back to Campbelltown. I'm like, oh, maybe not there. <laughs> like actually, that's when you really find out what you believe. I want to read out another scripture from you, so for you, it's just the back end 
the back end of this passage in James 4. So it says, instead, as we read before, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. Like to not seek God's will, just to put it plainly, is to boast in arrogance. He's saying that I don't need God to make decisions. I just need my own knowledge. To boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. Man, James goes for the jugular. And he goes on and says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. I don't know if you knew what the rest of this chapter is on. I highly recommend you read it. James goes hard after some stuff. He talks about murder. He talks about coveting. He talks about jealousy. He talks about adultery. He talks about like resisting the devil and not judging your neighbor. He goes after some heavy topics. And the climax is this passage. And he's saying, for you to not desire seeking my will is sin. It's on the same level as lying or as stealing or as murder or whatever the thing is. Like we make up a hierarchy. We have different hierarchies in our mind for what sin is better or worse. James, the real humdinger, and this is what I want to leave us on and I will, I will start to wrap in a sec, is that he's saying, if you know in your heart you should do it, that should be your moral guideline. That the attitude shouldn't be, well, is it in the Bible? Yes or no? Am I going to be sinning? Yes or no? It's like, no, the guideline should be, if you know that you should do it, do it. And he's saying what you should want to do is seek God with everything you've got. And he's raising the standard. And this is not to condemn anybody, but I've been praying all week and I pray now that you wouldn't feel condemned but convicted. And I've been praying that as I'm speaking, something has come to your mind that you know there's something that you should give up so that you can seek God more wholeheartedly. And I'm not going to lie, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, but I can guarantee you, if you see it to the end, it is always, always, always worth it. It is always worth it. If I can get the band up for the last song, I just want to give people a chance to spend some time as they're singing and you can sing with them too. But just to repent if that's the situation you're in and to be like, God, I'm so sorry that I haven't sought your will or maybe there's another level that I can go to and to give you a chance to do that and even be a chance to be like, God, like, please show me what you have for me. Or you might be someone that you're like, Matt, I don't even know if I know God's will. Like, I don't even know if I know God at all. I don't even know who Jesus is yet. And if that's the spot you're in, my goodness, he would love to get to know you. And if that is you, after this, I'm going to stand over to the side. And if you would love to meet him for the first time, I would love to introduce him to you. I would love to introduce him to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this group. Thank you for this time. And I pray that I pray that you would give people a chance to encounter you. In Jesus' name. Amen.